Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. Our goal is simple. We want to challenge you to think differently about finance and business. Join us and start the journey today. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. This is your co-host for the evening, Nathaniel Leach. And I am here with my colleagues, Tim Bickmore and Dan Weiss. And tonight, we have a special guest. Tim Bickmore. Welcome to the show, Tim. It's not as if it's your first one. I know. We decided that we were going to have, have all of us take turns so you get to know your hosts better and put each one of us on the hot seat. So, Tim, final last words before we kick this off? Yeah, well, thank you for having me on you know, the show. I appreciate it. I guess I'm more nervous for this than I was typically when we just do our regular podcasts. But I think my last words would be, it, it's, it's been a privilege to work with our clients and they usually are typically very vulnerable and open with us in order for us to do our jobs. And from a professional manner perspective, we sometimes don't get to be um, maybe as open or vulnerable with our clients back. And I'm going to try my best to be as open and vulnerable as possible in this, you know, for our clients and for our listeners. Okay, we're all excited for this. Let's uh, let's get this one out of the way, Tim. So that we can refer to this for the rest of this podcast. What is your childhood nickname and beyond? My my childhood nickname is Scooter. Uh, so everyone knows who's listening because everyone's going to say your first name is Timothy. That has no relation to Scooter whatsoever. I got that nickname because I had hips to, uh, hip dysplasia when I was younger, and so I never crawled, but I, what I would do is I would sit on my butt, and I would pull my legs, and I would scoot forward, and so my family called me Scooter, and it literally has stuck ever since, so if anyone has the privilege of being with me and my family at the same time, my name is not Tim. It is literally Scooter. And my daughter will correct me if, we, if she jumps on a Zoom call and, uh, and says, who are you talking to? And I say, oh, it's Tim. That's not Tim, that's Scooter. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is definitely me. <laughs> and for the record, what is your full legal name? Timothy Shane Bickmore. Where were you born? Salt Lake City, Utah. And how about some of your favorite pastimes? I have a lot of favorite pastimes, but to slim it down, I love the outdoors. Uh, I love sports. Um, I'm a golf, fish, hiking. Mushroom hunting has been a new hobby of mine recently. You know, reading, I've actually really enjoy reading now. I, I, I didn't pick that up till later in life. Um, you know, just spending times with my loved ones as well is just is something that I'm, I really enjoy. And when you were growing up, was there anything in particular from a profession standpoint that you wanted to be? When I was asked that question, I had one answer. I want to own a snowboard shop in Switzerland. I've heard you say that before. I know it's true. Before I hand it over to my esteemed colleague, uh, and a spoiler alert, because college is what brought you to Wisconsin. Now, you often will tell clients that you kind of fell into college. What do you mean by that? Oh, um, I guess I have to be open and vulnerable, like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. I, you know, I, I'm a planner, and I'll be honest, when I was 17, I was a little different. And I, I was very into the sport I loved, which was football. And I just wanted to go play football in college. And I really stumbled into college due to football, uh, to be very frank. I knew I wanted to get a good education, but I absolutely knew I wanted to play 40 games more of football. So I kind of lucked out. I had some help from a mentor I'll talk about in a little bit, um, from my mom and, uh, I kind of got into Lawrence University just through some sheer dumb luck. So Tim, tell us what you studied at Lawrence and how was it relevant then and now? So I studied, I, I was actually a very odd kid that I knew before I even went to Lawrence that I wanted a business degree. Uh, when I got to Lawrence, they were like, oh, I don't have a business school. I was like, well, what's the closest thing I can get? They said economics. So I said, that's my ticket. Um, and I ended up graduating with an economics degree. So I knew exactly what I wanted to do going into college. And that's exactly what I finished with. 
while I was in college, I, I really enjoyed finance, uh, the analytical piece, the numbers. So I took as many accounting and investment uh, classes as I could because that's what I felt like I wanted to do after I got out of school. So a lot that I learned, you know, a lot of people will say my degree wasn't very relevant. I would say that my degree was relevant, but the way that Lawrence taught me was probably more relevant to my career today than what I actually do. You know, so for the, the now question, I think that the critical thinking process that I learned through Lawrence University, which is a liberal arts education, was extremely beneficial in a lot of ways, um, as it's taught me how to be multidisciplinary and not just singly, single focused um, on one certain subject. So that innate curiosity that I do have has been a very big ben benefit. And I think Lawrence really honed me in, really focused me in that regard. So what pushed you to forming LBW? I know it was my sweet face, but what else was there in the equation? I think it was your sweet face, Nathaniel. Overall, what, what pushed me to form LBW? I mean, I will be honest, like the two of you were, was a really big deal. And I think we joke around about that. We kind of, you know, fell into each other or lucked out that having, you know, great individuals to work with, but excluding that, I think I always wanted to own my own business. So growing up, my father was a firefighter as well as a tile setter. And then I had uncles that were also in the small business realm. And my brother and I used to always talk about, oh, how could we, how could we, you know, make dad's business better? What could we do? And just that entrepreneurship, that, that critical thinking that just how do we grow something? And, and obviously, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to own a snowboard shop in Switzerland. I always had a business mindset and it was something that I always wanted to do. And I just had no idea it was going to be a wealth management firm. And so when I had the opportunity, I don't know that I really necessarily had to push myself I think as we talked about with a lot of our clients, I was just positioned to take the risk. You know, it was very riskless for me to actually to, to be able to start LBW and it was an opportunity. And I would say I'm a very opportunistic individual. And when I see an opportunity, I'm, I'm usually willing to take the bet and walk through that door. So it, it, it was, I, again, I think there's a lot of luck that came involved with that, but a lot of hard work as well. But so that's kind of how I got to that point. Well said. I, I would agree with most of that. So can you tell us what motivates you professionally? No, that's a really good question. And I think what really motivates me professionally today is, is really our clients, you know, and, and then the sense why I say that is I want to make sure that we provide the best service and the best value to our clients or anybody that we have the ability to speak with. And it's a never ending process. So, you know, playing football in high school, my coach used to always say, you can never reach perfection, but you can sure try to strive for it. And that's really the same kind of attitude I take to my professional career is we're always trying to strive for perfection. We may never, ever reach it, but if we can at least strive for it, then we know the outcome will probably be in our favor. And it's just a continuous process. And it's the I would say it's the process. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to learn as I mature at my older age that the process is important. And I think enjoying the process, understanding the process and continuing just to make sure that we provide as much value back to who we serve uh, pushes me day in and day out. So what would you say is the greatest reward or rewards from your work at LBW? This is one of my favorite questions. And Dan and I speak about it quite often because we talk with our clients on the most regular basis out of everybody in the firm. And before we started LBW or even before I really even started my career, I would have never fathomed that this would be the case of what I thought is the most joy or what I get out of um, what we do. And it's honestly having the privilege to get to know people in a very personal way from all walks of life. Um, you know, you know, we talk about people with, you know, that we speak to that are from other countries, you know, been poor, been rich, and, and you get to see their story, and you get to learn from their story. And so, you know, Dan and I talk about how it really has allowed us to mature and grow in ways that you just would never anticipate. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, and I'm extremely grateful for that. A lot of people in different industries just don't have the chance to speak with the people that we get to speak with and actually see how they became successful, see how they failed and learn from them. 
So I learn more from our clients than I ever anticipated. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. And I'm very, very grateful for that. It's very true. There's always a lot more under the cover than what most people see. Absolutely. Uh, what would you say your hopes are for LBW? You know, when we started the business, we always talked about what our hopes were for LBW when we first started. And I think that we've held true to that since we started five years ago. And what I always said, and I think we all say it in a different realm is, I just want our clients or people that we even get to talk with or speak with say, you know, thank God I met LBW. And what I hope for is that we continue to strive for that objective and be willing to evolve as well, right? And to be nimble and to adjust. I mean, we have evolved as a company significantly in a five-year period, but we've never gotten away from that overall goal. So we may look different today than we did five years ago, but we're still striving for it. And I hope that we just continue to have that as our North Star, our guiding compass, and just continue to push for that overall objective, which is just to help people out at the end of the day, whoever we have the privilege to help. It's very common practice for you to uh, speak with young individuals in a college setting, interns that we look to bring on and so on, and provide them perspective. What advice would you give someone that is about to enter into college? Specifically, what advice would you give to a young individual looking to study your major, which was economics, or wanting to go into this line of work? I would say, I mean, for someone who's entering college, I would I would definitely say, you know, make sure you explore, you know, and I think Nathaniel's a really, really good example of that, where Nathaniel's a history major, and his history major is so relevant to what he does today. So I don't think you should be scared of like, I have to be in the investment management, you know, degree, I have to get a business degree, I have to learn it. The technical side of our business is pretty straightforward, right? It's it's a lot of information, but it's not rocket science. You know, we're not MIT students here or, you know, engineering or physics. So you can definitely self be self-taught to a certain degree. And knowing the basics and knowing the lingo and knowing the terminology is, is very all good, all in good. But what I would very I would encourage is to be multidisciplinary. So to experience art, to experience you know, history, to experience physics, whatever it may be, because at the end of the day, what we do is we work with people and to be able to know a lot about a little is extremely powerful because what you can do is you can then relate to the, to the other individual. And, you know, Dan, you, you'd be, you know, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, but to be able to, to relate to somebody then allows us to do our job better because then they'll open up, right? Do you create a safe space? You, you create the trust. It's those soft skills that are so, so important and a lot of it really does come down to psychology. So even if you can take some psychology classes, understand human behavior, if you're in economics, behavioral economics, learn it, read it, think about it. it because I can tell you that even going through college and then working directly with people, it's very much true. Like people make decisions from a qualitative basis, an emotional basis more often than not. And so being able to, number one, relate to people, kind of to simplify, and then be able to understand how those people think and to be able to um, make sure that it's okay to, to understand that um, is really what I would highly suggest. Because in the technical stuff, get the CFP, get the CPWA, do all that fun stuff. But it's really understanding people and how to work with people. And those soft skills are just highly, highly important. So you know this next question is coming from me because it's going to start from a pessimistic standpoint, but it's not actually what I'm trying to get at. So uh, what would you say would be the failure that you cherish the most? So I, I had to think about that question quite a bit. And maybe I have an unpopular opinion and this is just me. Is I, I just don't really look at failure as failure in I think the traditional sense. I'm very much a personality where if something doesn't work out, the outcome doesn't turn out the way I want to, I always think, well, how can I do it different? How can I do it better? I, I don't see it as a, a door. I see it as a, you know, walking through that challenge. But thinking about it further, I think my biggest failure that I cherish the most and the reason why I cherish it is because I think it's going to dictate how I live my life going forward is I think I've failed significantly when it comes to enjoying the last 10 years graduating from college and trying to enjoy the process. I have, I am so goal oriented and I, I'm so future based 
that I haven't really sat back and enjoyed what I've done and how I've climbed the mountain that I've climbed thus far. You know, and looking back, it's it's kind of gone past me. So when I look back at where I was, you know, 10 years ago, it, it went very fast and I feel like I didn't appreciate it. So I would consider that probably a failure on my part. And I think going forward, I'm going to try to slow down a little bit and enjoy the process to come because I have plenty of years left and I just don't want to wake up and think, oh, why did you do it? I had my head buried way too much in the sand, just trying to achieve my objectives and my goals that I didn't appreciate the, the positives and the negatives of what I've gone through thus far. Great answer. Uh, I know you've had some great mentors in your life and I'm hoping that maybe you can share some thoughts as to who those people are and why they were such great mentors to you. Yeah, you know, the, the vulnerability piece, I think, is, is really big, um, probably for this question. And two people really come to mind for me for mentors. Um, the first one that I'll talk about and is probably the biggest mentor in my life is my mom. You know, I'm if you know me, I'm a mama's boy, for sure. And she's been the biggest mentor since I was a little kid. And we've we relate a ton in life in general. Um, she was my baseball coach. My dad wasn't. She was there um, in business. You know, today in in today's day and age, you know, she's a high level exec at a health tech company, and we talk about business. Like my mom has always been somebody that I can relate to. I have similar experiences with, um, and we just get along. You know, we've been getting along since you know probably the day I was born, and I'm ever grateful for like her experience. And what I love about it the most from my mom is that she's a woman. She's a woman in the business world and in a male's in a male's world, to be completely frank. And to get her perspective on some of her trials and tribulations over the years is just, it, it's shaped me in a way that makes me treat our employees or anybody that I work with differently to make sure that everyone feels that they are on the level playing field and that they're all recognized and respected. And so, I mean, I give a lot of credit to who I am and where I'm at today because of my mother. And I, I probably will till the, till the, till the day I die. Uh, the second person for a mentor is um, my, my head coach um, in high school. So his name was Brody Benson. My mother's name, by the way, was Anne, is Anne-Marie Bickmore. So my head football coach, Brody Benson, it was a extremely influential person in my life through a very difficult time probably in my life, you know, growing through high school. And then afterwards, you know, we're still great friends. I still call him and we talk a lot and maybe, you know, our relationship has evolved, but he taught me more about being disciplined, going through challenges, not giving up. You know, I mean, he shaped me into somebody that I think I'm a better person because of it. And, you know, I, I am ever grateful for him. And I think I always will be, um, he has been a very, very large and important piece to my to my life. And I want to say that I have a lot of other mentors, which I put you two on that on that bucket. Um, but I don't want to go too in depth because I know we are up, up for time. Curious as to what you would say troubles, concerns, bothers you the most when it comes to our industry that we are working so hard to change. Dan just knows how to get me fired up. Um, I have a lot of problems with our industry. I, I really do. And I, I have for a long time. And just to, to, to really boil it down to stuff that just really irritate me is the transparency. Now, most people would say the transparency and fees. I'm not talking about transparency and fees. I'm talking about transparency and service and what is really being provided to the end client. Being able to be at multiple firms, start our own firm, be engaged with others, read about others, listen about others. People do not service or provide the same kind of advice across firms. It's very different, very different levels. And that frustrates me because all of a sudden what that makes our title, a financial advisor become is commoditized. And we aren't the same advisor like another advisor or another advisor, similar to what people say about doctors. And it, it is frustrating because I do think we put in a lot of work and effort into our clients that is deserved where others may not. Which brings me to my second most frustrating piece of our industry is 
giving rule of thumb advice or general advice. I just think it's asinine. I just do. Like, it's so bad because everyone is different. And I'm a very, very big, big believer that everyone makes decisions for their own. Everyone's household is, is different. It's an, you have to think absolute, meaning how is it going to affect me and not, doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And our industry, in order to be more efficient and effective, which I understand from a business model perspective, forces that kind of mill work type of, of advice and information. And I just despise it. And if any, you know, if the listeners have gone through some of our planning practices, you know, we've developed and built our practices in a way that is customized and individualized because that's what it should be. That's what our advice should be because it only matters to the person you're talking to. So those are probably, I, there's multiple more, but those are the two that really irk me. Do a whole podcast just on that. Can you tell me what one of the biggest fin financial mistakes that you see people making? Um, if people listen to us enough, they probably heard this a lot, but it's just understanding the value of the dollar. I think that's the biggest mistake that people make and what that value means to them, which is, a, it's, and it's way harder. Like that's so simple. It's just a simple thing. If you, if you like, if I say you're like, oh yeah, duh, I know the value of dollar. It's like, but nobody really does. Nobody truly self-reflects and understands what is enough for them, not what's enough for their partner or their neighbor or their dad and mom or whatever it may be. And I, I think that's the biggest mistake people can make because it creates a lot of problems. It creates FOMO. It creates you getting into debt when you shouldn't be getting into debt, it, you know, and it, it creates a lot of psychological biases. And if you can really just boil down and be comfortable with how you view the dollar and what that, you know, and how you're going to value it, I think is the, the most powerful thing you can do from a financial perspective. It's simple, but I can tell you that from experience, it's very, very hard to do um, without, you know, practicing and, and coaching yourself. What would you say it takes to be a leader? Oh man, a leader. So I, you know, I think that, there's multiple leadership styles. I want to say that out, out, outright. And I think you can lead in, in different ways. Um, but honestly, if, if and, and this is why I say that and I preface it because, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of talk about what I think based off my leadership style. And I'm a very, very big believer that being a leader is a very, can be sometimes a very um, isolating and lonely place. Um, it really can. And, but what you need to make sure you realize is that you're on the same level with everyone. So what I mean by that is somebody who's sitting at the front office answering telephones is just as important as you, right? Someone who's doing the data entry, someone who's doing the strategic planning, everybody is the same. Everybody has importance because without that person, then the process may fall apart. And so you have to be humble. You have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to ask for help right? You have to be willing to show your failure, show your strengths. And, you know, I think that it's really what that means simplistically is you have to lead by example, you know, and I, I do think that that's a really important place and be humble enough to say when you're wrong and admit it. Um, and also be at the same time when you have to step in, be the force, like you need to be willing to adjust, evolve, change for the environment. Um, and for what's going on to make sure that the team is getting to where they need to be, which means you may have to give up power, you may have to give up um, decision making, you have to give decentralize yourself, right? It's, it's so important. And I think that's why there's not very many people that are good leaders, because I think it takes a lot of effort, self reflecting, and it can be very lonely. Sometimes. Good answer. So Tim, moving on to a little bit outside of uh, work topics, what would you say your greatest source of joy is? I had to think about that one for a while. Um, I would say my biggest source of joy, um, I, 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 I didn't really realize this um, until I thought about it. And my biggest source of joy is kind of twofold. Being outside, being in nature, um, and then being with the people that I really, really appreciate love and enjoy. I'm, I am an extrovert. I love people. I love to be around. I will, if I'm alone, I will find someone to be with. 
you know, that's, that's just who I am at the core. Um, but I also love the outdoors, you know, and, and I say that it's weird that I didn't really realize that, but growing up, I played baseball. I played football. I went fishing with my dad. I was outside all day, every day in the dirt. And so once the outdoors went away and I was stuck in an office staring at a computer, I didn't realize how much I truly love just being outside. And, and I appreciate it so much more. So going fishing with my brother, you know, going golfing with my mom and my stepdad or my dad, or going surfing with my dad, that's nothing can be, nothing's better than spending time with people I love outside or recently with my girlfriend mushroom hunting, which is also, a, is extremely fun. Cool. So uh, what would you say that your most, uh, your favorite place that you've traveled to is? I've, tra- I've had the privilege to travel quite a bit internationally. And so that's a very difficult question for me to ask because, you know, it's like asking me my favorite movie. I won't give it to you. Um, but I'm going to bucket it. I'm going to bucket that into three categories. Most beautiful place I've ever been, Switzerland, hands down. Most picturesque, it is just beyond gorgeous. And as people probably realize that I love the outdoors. Switzerland is unbelievable. Um, fishing trip, I would say I went, you know, a year ago with my brother to Idaho. And that was probably one of the best fishing trips I've ever been on. That was fantastic. And then from a cultural immersion, my father lives in Nicaragua and going there and being able to visit and be part of the culture from like a a local's perspective is something you just, I wish everybody could experience. It's just an eye opener. What is your most favorite board game? Playing chess with my nephew, Will. Not chess, sorry, checkers. We play checkers. I always say chess, oh, it's checkers. I was going to say, that kid is smart. And I, he's good at checkers. I have to really think about it. We played just <laughs> the other day and it was a battle. I ended up winning because he just made a few mistakes because he's five, but. <laughs> <laughs> five at chess? You might've been talking about a chess prodigy there. Okay. Yeah, checkers, checkers. Got it. If you knew that your last meal was coming, what would you want it to be and why? I will always start with my drink will be a very nice glass of water. I love water. So that would be my drink of choice. I, I know that's odd. Everyone would probably say a beer or something, but no, water. I just want water. And my, my meal, it's just, it's a battle between Mediterranean Mexican or sushi. I'd have to decide at the time. <laughs> oh man, you, you got to Okay. No, I'm not going to let this slide. All right. For the for the favorite places, yeah, I gave you a few buckets. Pick your favorite meal. Probably sushi straight from the ocean. There we go. I nailed him. Good deal. I need to start sticking it to him. Got it. Got to have discipline, man. Got to discipline. Dan, to you. Oh, didn't realize I was up. Great. Tim, how would you say a person best help another? You know, I, I say this a lot about our clients, and I think we've, I've been saying it since we started our business. Through experience with working with so many people, everyone just wants to be heard. You know, people just want to be heard. And so to help someone, I really do think just listening and truly listening, you know, like actually hear them, make them feel as if you've heard them is something that is beyond helpful for so many people and just making them feel respected. At the end of the day, you can help people tenfold if you just do those two things. Fantastic answer. Uh, on the lighter side, what's the biggest fish you ever caught? So the biggest fish I think I've ever caught was a muskie on Lake Manaqua. And I believe it was 38 inches and it was roughly like 17 pounds. That was probably the biggest fish I've ever caught. That's a big fish. And outside of your subject of formal study, what subject fascinates you the most? I think I know this answer, but... Anyone knows me well, they probably do know this answer. I'm a nerd. I'll admit it. I'm a very much a nerd and I love to learn. Um, but physics and space, just absolutely. I love every minute of it. I, uh, to be honest, okay, if I'm going to be vulnerable, is I will read about going to Mars or physics or so, and it actually de-stresses me. It calms me down. I love the theoretical theory philosophy but yeah physics in space i always say 
I think in my second life, I'll probably be an astrophysicist. <laughs> Thought you'd say something like that. And uh, last question before we leave some final thoughts and bid our, our uh, audience a fair night. Why do you podcast? Nathaniel's going to like this answer. I have a feeling. Because I'm a terrible writer and I can speak well and I, and I talk a lot. So podcasting just makes sense for me. A lot of honesty in all of these questions that went the most. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yes. Um, just leaving some final thoughts, if nothing else, because it's what we do at the end of these podcasts. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll begin and pass it to Nathaniel and, of course, give our guests the final words. Final thoughts I have on, on this special edition of our podcast. Everybody has a story. And like Tim said so eloquently, we are privileged to hear many stories. And I think that it's easy to forget that we are all humans and we all have our own stories. And there's a lot of power in having the opportunity to tell them and get to know people on different levels. In a sense, it brings a whole nother level of humanity to us. So I really am thankful, Tim, that you took this opportunity to allow the audience to get you to get to know you a little bit better and just share a little tip of the iceberg of your story. I echo Dan's comments. And I also wanted to place a spotlight on uh, what you said for how does a person best help another. Uh, the act of listening is just so underestimated. People really do just want to be heard. It's so true. It's so simple and yet so true. And to you. Thank you, Nathaniel. I appreciate that. My final words is I've said enough, so I have nothing to add. And we all thank you, the audience, for taking time out of your night to hear about a bit of Tim's story and listen to three guys talk about their love for finance. Thank you for joining us in Thinking Critically. Have a great night. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time. The opinions expressed in this program are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual on any specific security, on any specific broker dealer or custodian. It is only intended to provide education about the financial industry. To determine which investments, broker, dealer, or custodian may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this program is no guarantee of future results. As always, please remember investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinion of Leach, Bickmore, and Weiss Wealth Management, LLC. Leach, Bickmore, and Weiss Wealth Management, LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Leach, Bickmore, and Weiss Wealth Management, LLC and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. No advice may be rendered by Leach, Bickmore, and Weiss Wealth Management, LLC unless a client service agreement is in place.